So here's a remark from Longino that sort of those examples reflect the truth of. She says, when background assumptions are shared by all members of a community, they acquire an invisibility that renders them unavailable for criticism. They do not become visible until individuals who do not share the community's assumptions can provide alternative explanations of the phenomena without those assumptions. So the male primatologists were missing out on the interests of female apes because they weren't interested in them. <laughs> so. Okay, so the issue about the background assumption here is actually much more complicated. The background assumption was actually that in order to maximize their chances for sending their genes down into the next generation, men tried to have sex with as many partners as possible, but women, because they could only carry one child and it was a very long and laborious process and that they were vulnerable while they were pregnant, the thought was they would try to attach to a single male, a strong male, who would look out for them and so forth. Then, when women entered into the field of primatology, they found out that wasn't true. And the background assumption that the male primatologists seemed to share was that ape society would reflect our conventions and our assumptions about what women were like. So that's the background assumption that was disrupted when female primatologists entered into the field. And so when people who come in who have those interests they'll pick up on them and these background assumptions that have been at work suddenly become visible. So I think that's an interesting idea. So Helen Longino says she kind of takes this idea of objectivity as a social achievement and applies it to this notion that science is self-correcting. Sometimes you hear this, that science is inherently self-correcting because of the nature of the inquiry. And she says, science doesn't really correct itself. Scientists correct each other through the social processes of what she calls transformative interrogation. So she says, the objectivity of individuals in this scheme consists in their participation in the collective give and take of critical discussion, and not in some special relation of detachment or hard-headedness that they may bear to their observations. So this is a lot like what I was saying in my writing videos, actually, about philosophy being this kind of intrinsically conversational process. She's saying that science is objective and self-correcting because scientists have been socialized into this critical process where they reach out these findings, they submit their research to peer review, and there's this kind of constant interrogation and criticism and challenging of each other's views. And that process is what sort of cleans their beliefs up. So an individual can come up with lots of interesting thoughts and develop them in interesting ways and so on. Individuals aren't unimportant, but the real magic of science, it happens in this domain of intense criticism. That is the real crucible of scientific knowledge, social criticism. So objectivity, she says, emerges as a function of community practices rather than as an attitude of an individual researcher. So Longino, she agrees with Harding. She says, objectivity isn't a binary. It's not an on-off thing. It's not a zero-one proposition. You maximize objectivity by optimizing avenues for open discussion criticism, and diversity of standpoints. So this is how she understands all of these kind of protocols for conducting scientific research and submitting all of your evidence to scrutiny from the sort of broader scientific community, but also giving your findings over to the publication process where they could be subjected to peer review. That is the idea. You're trying to maximize objectivity by creating all these avenues for discussion, criticism, and standpoint diversity. And that's what conferences are for, too. So there's all of these mechanisms that are sort of built into the practice of science and the way a scientific community functions. So for Longino and Harding, those social processes are what make science objective. Of course, no one is saying that diversity is a cure for all epistemic ills. It's not guaranteed that if you have a diverse epistemic community that you're going to arrive at significant truth. So she's not saying that, and neither is Harding or Longino. They're saying that the more diversity you have, on average, the greater objectivity you're going to have. So diversity of standpoint in this process of transformative interrogation is your best shot at achieving objectivity, self-correction, and significant truth. So 
what these three philosophers agree on then is that science is fundamentally consensual. Consensus doesn't guarantee truth. They're all fallibilists. They are all people who will say, we know that P, but there's an insignificant chance that P is false. That's what a fallibilist is. A fallibilist is someone who can say, yeah, I know this. I'm pretty certain that it's true, but there is some insignificant chance that it might be false. So a fallibilist admits they don't have positive knowledge. They don't have absolute certain knowledge. But even though consensus can't guarantee truth, it does show that a claim reflects the critically achieved consensus of a scientific community, and it's not clear that we can hope for anything better than that. So that's Longinot, and, and Oreskes kind of gives Longinot the last word on that. She says, I agree. It's the best that we can do. It's the, it's the best thing that we have is scientific consensus when it comes to achieving knowledge about the world around us. Take another break, and we'll sum up Oreskes' two main reasons why you should trust science.